Hey everyone, welcome back. If you've clicked on this video without checking out part 1 and 2 first, I highly recommend you do, or you'll be pretty lost. And you'll be seeing a massive spoiler in 5 seconds. Oh no, 3, 2, 1! <laughs> 2B is dead, and you won't be in control of her for the rest of the game. It's a hard fact to swallow, but that's the reality the game is giving us. 9S, committed on killing A2, was knocked down into the ravine as a mysterious white tower sprouted from the ground. One thing I love about the fallout of 2B's demise is the little time you have to mourn 2B's death. The only thing we're left with as the screen fades to black are the robotic voices of two emotionless pods, confirming to us that she is indeed gone, and it's now probably time to jump onto the next Sundere Tinkam bombshell. At this point, the game splits. You have the choice of following the path of A2 or 9S. For the video's sake, we'll be following the path of A2, which gives us a teeny tiny little glimpse into her life before the main events of Nier Automata ever began. And speaking of those very events, I think it's finally time to give you all a little context Text into the Yorha stage play, a prequel to Automata and A2. Now, logically, if I was to summarise the entirety of this play, we'd all be here until you're calling me old man Clemps, and quite frankly, I'd rather finish the analysis whilst my pubes are nice and chestnut brown. So, we'll be focusing largely on the points which I think will enrich your overall experience of Automata. It's also worth mentioning that the entire stage play was unofficially translated by the Twitter user Rekka Alexiel. Their site, Fire Sanctuary, is a goldmine for for lovers of Yoko Taro's spin-off materials, which were previously untranslated. Great member of the Draken Near community, and I highly recommend you check their site out. The stage play opens in a similar way to Automata. A group of Yorha troops are sent down to Earth to fight machine lifeforms. However, this time they're sent down to Pearl Harbor, and things take a much more violent turn for the worse. <laughs> The number of Yorha troops drop like flies, including their captain, so the commander decides to make the Yorha member named Number 2 take over the reins. Four of the original Yorha troops survive, those being Number 2, Number 4, Number 16, and Number 21. Number 2 also happens to be the former name of the android we now know as A2. They're saved by the resistance camp after they're attacked by a large number of machines. These specific androids were sent down by command and abandoned on Earth for over 100 to 200 hundred years. At first, the resistance see the Yorha troops as a threat, since they had no idea that new models of androids were even being produced, but eventually agree to welcome them into their ranks after they save an android called Lily from succumbing to the logic virus. As before Yorha troops were invented, they had no method of ridding it without politely inserting a bullet into said individual's skull. Oh, speaking of the resistance members, you may notice a theme with their naming conventions. It's pretty subtle, so I won't blame you if you don't get it. We have Rose, Dahlia, Daisy, Lily, Aster, Anemone, Clematis, Calmia, Sonia, Erica, and Marguerite. Oh, I wonder. Oh, I wonder what the theme will be. It's almost as if Yoko Taro has a big stiffy over having vague connections to flowers throughout the series. We have the entirety of Dragon Guard 3, from the parasite in Zero's eye to the Queen Beast's introduction, the Lunateer and its mechanical counterpart during Nier's ending E, 6O's fascination with flowers during her side quest, an automata short story based around a machine attempting to grow flowers, and even even a voice over the tannoy within the bunker as it was overrun with infection. Oh, this is so much fun! The virus we planted is blossomed into a beautiful flower! Now either this man really wants to become a botanist, or there's going to be some potential future relevance to these inclusions. Or it could possibly be something that Yoko Taro particularly likes and wants to include. No themes necessary, which is Fine, but the main villain of Dragon Guard 3 being a flower and the Lunar Tear really make me wonder about their potential relevance. Fragility? Beauty? Adaptability? Maybe we'll find out in a future title. Back onto the stage play. For a majority of the play's runtime, it revolves around a lot of the themes we're already familiar to. What it really means to be alive. What it really means to be human. There's a lot of the same talk of individuality within this play, especially when it comes down to memories. Every android within this squad were assigned 
human memories, presumably extracted from the Gestalt data on the moon or by some other means. For number four, she has the memories of being a regular schoolgirl, hanging out with her friends, playing games and dressing up, etc. For number two, she has the memories of living out in the country with her grandmother. Here's where I'll go all the way back to part one of the analysis, where I addressed A2's possible connection to the fan favourite Kaine from the original Nier. Now first and foremost, this is nothing more than a popular fan theory. Do I believe it's true? I'd like to think so. Now when I say A2 is connected to Kaine, I don't mean this Kaine. This Kaine is the replicant of the real Kaine. And that's the one I think A2's memories have possibly been taken from. The original human version of Kaine also lived with her grandmother back when humans were alive on Earth as made apparent by the Near Drama CD. However, the general attitude of the grandmother named Carly within the CD is fairly abusive and rude. Excuse me, can you move your car, please? Compared to the peaceful life A2's memories seem to recollect. The similarities between her post-stage play personality and Kaine's, however, are too close for comfort. And to then throw in a segment about grandmothers, something which is a key emotional memory that Kaine clings onto, seems to be nodding heavily towards the fanbase with a slow, meticulous wink. Now, when I first wrote the script, I thought I had another legitimate piece of evidence coming from Emil, saying that A2 either reminds him or smells like her. Turns out, after I couldn't find this in game for hours on end and couldn't even find it in the dialogue text files, I may have triggered an accidental case of Mandela effect within my followers. So many people are convinced that they've seen this too, but no one can fucking find the damn thing. So if someone can reach out to a translator of this game and can find out whether or not this is a complete fabrication that we've all systematically dreamt up, I'd really appreciate it. Maybe this is a community clinging on to false hope that a fragment of our favourite bitch queen still lives on. I miss her so much, you guys. Release the figurine already, you hacks! Other than that, number two befriends a test subject called Seed, an android that's specific function is to test out the weapons that the troops use. The commander, predictably, makes her death which occurred via essentially crushing her under the weight of electromagnetic pressure to the point of system failure seem more like a total accident. Number two takes her death to heart, and it's more than likely the start of her bitterness towards their situation. Oh. What are these? <laughs> what are these two up to? <laughs> After this, well, a, a whole bunch of shit happens. Some of it's fine, but some of it I'm like, eh. Essentially, two characters who I assume to be the operators called Futaba and Yotsuba are questioning the commander over some suspicious pieces of dialogue. The remaining Yorha troops and members of a resistance camp need to travel to the top of Mount Kayala in order to reach an elevator which will bring them to a server room which controls all of the machine lifeforms for the entire Pacific. However, she mentions that the mission will probably fail and that this was a scenario from the very beginning. Then, everyone fucking dies. Tell me it ain't so, you little cunt. <laughs> Number 21 gets the logic virus and asks an enemy to blow her brains out. Are you okay? Number 16 takes herself out in a group detonation with Lily, Marguerite and Dahlia, which always struck me as weird. Considering how the first time we meet with Lily, she's noted as being different from the other androids because her fear of death is alarmingly high. But apparently in the few acts she's been on, she transitioned from death? No thanks to DEATH TO THE INFIDELS! I mean, I'm glad she got over a fear, but really? So now, number four and number two, alongside the Resistance camp members, Rose, Daisy, Asta, Sonia, Erica, and Vegeta, are the only remaining androids left who are in reach of the elevator. They come face to face with two little girls dressed in red, the very same girls we see observing 9S and 2B within Automata, who are the physical manifestation of the machine's terminal, made in the image of the androids. These two girls have also been observing the androids throughout the stage play, commenting on why the androids do things like sacrifice themselves for others, or what it means to laugh, robotically attempting to replicate it.
Daisy, Erica and Asta are quickly obliterated by the machines under the control of the Red Girls. The two Red Girls then decide to drop Number 2's motivation into going against command and becoming the A2 we know today. They announce that by hacking, they found out this entire thing was pre-planned by command. The Yorha Squadron was created as experimental weapons. The data that will be uploaded from their deaths will be used to create even stronger Yorha models. Shortly after, Rose dies protecting Sonya from the bio machines, leaving Number 4 and Number 2 as the last one standing. Number 4's all, fuck you, but the Red Girls are all, fuck you, times two, nya nya, and proceed to use the reanimated Resistance members to finish her off. Number 2 is, by this point, a little fucking grumpy, but the Red Girls, naming themselves Term Alpha and Term Beta, drop the final nail in the coffin towards Number 2's eventual defiance. None of the Yorha troops sent down to Earth knew their black box capabilities, and the fact they can be used as bombs, which will detonate the server room. An unknowing noble sacrifice to put a dent into the machines, a victory that was paved with the deaths of Number 2's comrades. However, Number 4, who is apparently being a cheeky madam and pretending to be dead, overhears this. She pushes Number 2 aside and blows herself and the server room up. The Red Girls predictably live through this, however, claiming that they find the androids interesting and how they should play in this world a little longer. They leave laughing. However, compared to their once robotic laughter, it now sounds a lot more human, indicating that the Red Girls have now acquired emotion. The two operators named Futaba and Yotsuba, according to new information, were actually sent to Earth by the commander over her guilt that they were constantly being reformatted, due to their curiosity about the classified data. The final moments within the stage play show us that Number 2 is in fact still alive, as she raises her sword up to the sky, presumably towards command in defiance, becoming the a2 we are now able to play as in Automata. Now before I move back to where we left A2, I first need to commend the stage play. I haven't spoken about the actual performance, but as someone who spent a majority of his life in theatre productions and even took a course in performing arts, the production is nothing to shake your head at. It's incredibly low budget, sure, but the performers are clearly giving it their all. And the choreography and lighting cues during the fight scenes are legitimately well timed and fluid for a stage performance. So whilst we may raise an eyebrow at some of the more questionable lines in the script, for a stage play production which is from, at first glance, very low budget, the performers all did a fantastic job with the material given to them, and I need to give major props to every single one. I can guarantee that with the right cameras and lighting, this would probably be a really fun movie. And maybe they'll eventually get round to making a subtitled version in the West, you never know. So back to A2. She awakens after being knocked unconscious by the tower's ascent from below the Earth, and it's here where she's introduced to something that proves more of a problem to her than the tower. Greetings and salutations to you, my queen. Who are you? My name is the Panty King, and it is my duty to assist in the removal of your undergarments. I didn't ask for help. Please, God, I'm begging you. I'm so lonely. What the hell is that huge thing? Lol. Proposal. Call me a bitch and crush me to death between your android thighs. Why the hell would I do that? I yearn for death, yet I lust for a woman's touch. Not happening. You wound me, madam. Let words no longer escape your silicone lips. You're the one who keeps talking. Fucking around aside, the interactions A2 has with Pod042 are probably some of my favourite interactions in the game. It's as if you took Zero from Drakengard 3 and teamed her up with Vice who's had one too many Xanax, and is not gonna let this little miss get away from the table without eating her vegetables even if he has to repeat himself till he's blue in the fucking face. Pod's reasoning for tagging along with A2 is simply because it was the final order of 2B before her passing, something which is clearly going down rather well. Shut. The. Hell. Up. Negative. After enlightening Pod about her intentions, he ushers her over to the desert where a Goliath-class machine is lying in wait underneath the sand. This is a good point to bring up the changes that A2 brings to the gameplay, but I won't linger on them for too long. All in all, she's fairly similar to 2B, with a few differences. First is her dash ability, which both 2B and 9S have, but A2's can be extended by holding the dash button, which also increases her damage output by a little bit. Secondly is Berserk Mode, which I ultimately hardly used, and personally 
be found a little useless. You can deal massive amounts of damage with the right plug-in chip, so having a mode which increases damage dealt against you whilst also having a tick down effect on your health for a DPS boost isn't what I call inherently useful. Thirdly, the biggest thing that sets A2 apart from 2B and 9S is her ability to taunt, which essentially pisses off the enemy and pumps both A2 and the opponent with the tiniest pinch of steroids. All in all though, I'd say A2's gameplay feels like an unintentional apology to people who weren't all that happy with 9S's style of combat. It's fast, heavy attacks are back in fashion and you can zip around like a goddamn edgy lunatic, fucking activate your Sharing gun and shit, using all of these new mechanics together and making it through the abysmal camera placements but will more than likely cause 50% of your deaths due to getting your perfectly formed android butt blasted off with a surprise laser attack, the boss will ultimately be defeated. After it uses an EMP attack as a desperate last attempt, we're sent into A2's memory modules, where it seems that not only are we given a very interesting little glimpse into 2B's memory due to the memory merge, perhaps hinting that 2B wasn't the person we thought she was, but the enemy's memories have been merged with A2's as well. At the end of this tiny dungeon, she finds and destroys what seems to be the source of the machine's memory, calling out hopelessly for its mother. We then see a flicker of 2B, saying they aren't so different. No one will help them, and all they can do is cry and scream. At this point, we're given the option to choose to continue a 2 story or revisit 9S. But for now, I'm actually going to let a guest share a few words about Automata for a minute or two, specifically about the deceptive marketing strategy surrounding Root A and Root B and A2's appearance. Take the stage, you cheeky gremlin. Hi there everyone, I am Valkyrie Aurora. If you don't know me, I am a Yoko Taro themed YouTuber like Clemps, who sometimes dabbles into other properties. But today, I'm here to talk about Nier Automata's deceptive marketing strategy. Remember when Nier Automata's first few trailers came out and speculation began on how 2B got so messed up, and how Adam and Eve are pure cinnamon rolls who assumedly would have a much bigger character presence? The beginning of Route C and D completely flipped those theories on their heads. Heads. A2 was always presented to us as a long-haired B model, so when the trailer showed us this woman in the desert, we'd of course naturally assume this was 2B. It was only until this section of the game opened up to us that we realized we'd all been duped. In the best way possible. One thing me and Clemps universally agree on, however, is Adam and Eve's minor roles. The trailers tricked us yet again by making us assume that these two brothers would be there till the end, only to die miserably during the first two endings. I would have liked for them to have had more of an inclusion, not only because both characters are so inherently interesting, but because, I mean, just look at them! Look at this! Care for a fucking? <laughs> Deceptive marketing like this is a perfect way to advertise your game, so long as you do it right. And Automata hit the nail on the head by making it seem as if Chubi was alive throughout the entire game, thus removing any thought of her dying from our heads before playing. Then, when you're suddenly hit with that moment, it makes it all the more powerful and meaningful. I think one thing is for sure. And that's whenever Yoko Taro's new game comes out, a lot of us within the community are going to be wondering how much of the trailers can be taken at face value. Okay, that's me. I'm done. I'm outie. Ninus is the best boy. Don't you dare say otherwise. I'll find you. I'm out! The deceptive marketing was so strong that during the segments in the desert whilst A2 was fighting for Goliath and seeing how the cutscenes were in fact A2 and not 2B, I think it was really at this point where I accepted 2B's death completely and had a newfound appreciation for when deceptive marketing can actually be done to benefit a user's experience rather than serve as a detriment. So moving back onto the story, A2 has woken up after her encounter with the Goliath. Turns out her fuel filter is clogged due to all of the sand in the vicinity, which I don't know, causes either clogged arteries or severe constipation. But the fact is, due to Command being completely destroyed and being wanted dead or alive by Yorha anyways, the only place she can get repairs are from the Resistance Camp, a place she must have avoided for some time after the slaughter of her companions. Upon reaching the camp, she happens upon Pascal who's being hounded by aggressive machines. Noticing that she has the attitude of a rabid dog, he quickly explains that he's passive and means her no harm. Please don't end my life, you sexually provocative psychopath. You're actually given the choice to kill him here, the correct option obviously being to let him live. If you choose to kill him, you're booted back to the start screen with a patronizing slap on the cheek. Within the resistance camp, A2 meets with an enemy for the first time since the stage play. An enemy pleased to see that she still lives. 
A2 breaks the news to an enemy that 2B is dead, and when asked if she wants to be shown around the camp, she declines, stating that 2B's memory lie within her sword. I'll admit, I never truly understood this part, as in 2B's memory transfer to A2. Please correct me if I'm wrong, because I think we all know within these large videos, I can slip up once or twice, but I don't think it's explained how memories transfer over from... swords. Like, do swords act as flash drives for androids? You kinda put everything in there and throw it into a nearby USB and suddenly the recipient android has access to all of your not safe for work memories folder? Hey binge, dying of robo cancer, hold my fucking dongle. But anyways, an enemy now has to awkwardly break into A2, but the resistance camp is now working alongside Pascal's village. It makes sense that the resistance would ally themselves with the village due to their pacifism and resources. But for A2, whose only goal has been to annihilate machines, it might be a little difficult to understand. That being said, she did choose not to kill Pascal. Perhaps 2B's memories are having more of an effect on her subconsciousness than we originally thought. When they get to Pascal's village, Pod042 walks her over to him like a father walking his angsty teenage daughter over to a distant relative, and requests a new fuel filter so she'll no longer have a bad case of the grumpy dumpies. Now when I first played Automata, the next hour or so got me a little restless. It's a combination of fetch quests and going back and forth from Pascal's village to the resistance camp. And during my first playthrough, I was being a big baby and wanted something that felt a little more story crucial. It was probably one of the few nitpicks I had, that and the single most cursed enemy I've ever encountered in a game. I felt this until my second and third playthrough, when I took into account how well this segment does as setting up a perfect calm before the storm scenario. During the back and forth, we're shown a side of A2 that we haven't seen before. She's actually socialising, albeit extremely badly, with the machines. Maybe this is due to 2B's memories influencing her persona, but the fact is, instead of mindlessly slaughtering machines to quench her revenge, she's begrudgingly helping the children create something to play on, even offers to pay Pascal back for the fuel filter he gave her due to handing it over for free. It's great that the game was setting up this lighter side to A2, because when we eventually hit the crotch punch moment, we can sympathise somewhat with the character we're controlling. Before we whip open our umbrellas and brace for the incoming storm, our robo-daddy over here is reading a book on philosophy, specifically the works of the German-born Friedrich Nietzsche. <laughs> Pascal comments that Nietzsche must have been a profound thinker, or perhaps he skipped right past profound and went straight to crazy instead. It's probably worth bringing up that Nietzsche was the philosopher who made the phrase God is dead popular, a theme which, as we know, resonates hard within Automata's main story. The entire Santa analogy I came up with in part 2 essentially explains how he came up with this particular argument. Pascal's comment could also link in with the philosopher he was named after, Blaise Pascal, who cooked up the argument of Pascal's wager. Essentially, it boils down to the idea that a rational person should live through their lives as if God exists, because the gain you get from him existing is better than someone not believing in God and finding out he's real, since if we're looking at the Christian God, you'll more than likely be thrown into hell. Automata, in a slightly similar vein to Nier, borrows a lot of its characters' names. However, juxtaposed to Nier, Automata doesn't borrow names from fictional fairy tale characters, but rather, a few machines are named after human philosophers. As to why this is, I'll comment on it in part 4, but I feel it has some potential relevance. Anyways, Pascal talks to the children of the village, saying he'll play with them if they finish their studies. He promises them, and Pascal never breaks his word. This bodes well. Playing as A2 on the back and forth fetch quest, we suddenly get an urgent call from Pascal. Something horrible is going down at the machine village, and there's no way to teleport there, meaning we have a nice five minute journey thinking about what terrible thing could be taking place. What the hell? The machines are eating each other? The machines within the village have turned on each other, going from members of a tightly knit family to slaughtering and devouring each other. Pascal, in a blind panic, agrees to escort the remaining machine children to safety within the abandoned factory. Everything appears to be going well, but somehow the other machines have found out their location. Something inside Pascal flips at this point, as he throws away his stand on pacifism in order to save the children, furiously declaring that he'll smash them up and kill them. 
A2 tries her hardest to fend them off outside, but their numbers keep growing. Pascal then decides to make me fist pump the air till my arm gets tired by taking control of an angel type Goliath and having a strangely pretty duel with an opposing model. Question is, was all of this worth it, or would the game finally deliver on its slow building finale to the storm? It turns out that Pascal made a mistake, something he could have never fully predicted. He taught the children about fear. By teaching them about fear, they took their own lives instead of using it as an instinct to survive. Because of this, Pascal has decided that he can no longer live with the heartbreak inside of him and asks A2 to either kill him or destroy his memory. There's also a third option, which is to leave him entirely. And the more I thought about it, leaving him is perhaps the more human approach. Killing him could be seen as an inhuman act. Taking a life due to heartbreak is an extremely harsh method to help someone get over their grief. And if this was the case in real life, there would never be a single teenage girl or boy. Deleting his memory at first seems like a more humane way of dealing with it. However, as we know from machines, they have a tendency to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. Meaning that Pascal would only try to replicate this idea of a village again in the future, and the results may very well end up the same. Leaving him gives him the act of free will. He could take his own life, or live with his heartbreak, and eventually find a solution to move on, as humans do. And whilst this situation is something, I hope, a huge portion of us would never have to experience, I think this third option would in the long run be considered the correct choice. If any of them are even correct at all. However, that being said, in this playthrough I actually decided on wiping his memory, because what happens later because of this only makes this entire situation even more tragic. Thank you, A2. Thank you. Moving past that tragedy, the game now auto-locks us into whoever's path we didn't initially complete first. For us, it's the walking tragedy 9S. He wakes up to find a couple of old friends being all, I'll suck your dick. Oh, give us a minute, pet. Something you'll notice throughout 9S's segments is that he's essentially the polar opposite in terms of character growth. Whilst A2 warms as a personality, 9S gets colder. One of the first things he asks when he wakes up is, where's 2B? Which not only confirms to 9S that she is indeed dead, but also reminds the audience that our Butimus Maximus is now in the scrap heap. Turns out, Deviler and Popler in this game are separate models to the one we knew in the original Nier. The Deviler and Popler type of android were apparently spread across the globe to watch over the replicants, but when the disaster occurred with the models we're familiar with, the Deviler Popler android type was ostracized around the globe for their sins. Another classic link into human behavior. I don't think any of us can deny after World War II, even if a German civilian was totally opposed to the war, they were still spat at in the street due to the sins of their ex-leader. Even if these particular models weren't involved, they're still universally despised due to their appearance, resembling those who essentially allowed the extinction of humanity. What's even more messed up is that these two models have absolutely no memory of the large-scale operation they were created to oversee, due to the records from that time being deleted. They now serve as guinea pigs, allowed to remain in the resistance camp to repair broken android parts. They even see this as atoning for their sins, despite not doing anything whatsoever and having no memory of the event occurring. After thanking the twins, 9S sets off to take a look into the strange machine structure that appears to resemble the material that we used in Adam's copied city. He attempts to hack into the door, but it's all sorry, and a mocking female voice tells him he needs to visit three structures in order to unlock it. He also admits to Pod that after he's destroyed every single machine, he'll find and kill A2. This is what 9S will be doing for his segment, running to different areas, finding these strange machine structures, and destroying the core. The first when he gets to introduces the android to the angelic alphabet. Pod 153 translates it as meat box. Pleasant. During his ascent into the meat box, we see his insanely obvious denial of the machine's ability to feel pain, ignoring their cries and yelling at them to shut up. Two out of three of these boxes that 9S has to ascend into are essentially arenas, which are filled with things to break down 9S's already fragile mental state and very angry machines. Come on, coward! Coward! I'm not 
know that I want to punch you in the nose. I'll beat your goddamn ass, you son of a bitch. You're an intellectual dumbass. And I'm coming. Making it to the top, 9S, in a sociopathic state, orders Pod 153 to use everything she has on the core, which is begging to be helped. Even the Pod questions this act, but regardless, she follows her orders and obliterates it. The further 9S goes, the more he breaks. His Pod tries to get him to undergo some sort of medical check and to rest, but 9S predictably ignores her pleas. The next structure, named the Soul Box, is an interesting one. In here, the female voice from the tower tells 9S that he's being gifted for all of the machine lives that he's taken. Eventually, he gets the biggest prize of them all, the information that your her black boxes are made out of machine cores. 9S's reaction here is, in my opinion, weak for the importance of the reveal. Yes, they go into more detail later, but considering how vitally important this information is, it would have been nice to have the game slow down a bit with a cutscene, allowing this information to sink in. This information being that your her androids and machines are basically one and the same same. Machines that repeat things over and over, being unable to learn. Androids that now do things over and over. But, despite 9S's lack of reaction to this, it's also good at setting up his inevitable journey into legitimate trauma. Denial is one hell of a powerful drug. When 9S goes to take out the core, he's taken into his own mind. He sees a vision of 2B, and it's obvious with his movements that he genuinely does miss her. However, whatever is orchestrating this event slowly begins to delete the memories of 2B within 9S, causing him to repeatedly stab the now black figure standing in the middle of the room. This black figure turns out to be an empty shell of 2B. My general interpretation of this is not only the machines fucking with 9S, but the idea of 2B taking on the form of a machine's consciousness, more than likely meaning that 9S is now slowly beginning to see your her androids as machines, only further pushing him down into a very dark, confusing pit. 9S sinks down and begins weeping, as the two pods look at each other with the slow realization of, oh shit. Hello and welcome to Pod 042 Cheers Up The Boy. Perhaps he would like a refreshing swig of the bag of juice. <coughs> Shit, maybe a tasty carrot snack. <coughs> Failure. Or could he be craving a delicious crunchy apple? <coughs> Cut. Conclusion. Work on my people skills. Also, buy more apples. And with that, the main chunk of 9S's solo content has been completed. The paths of 9S and A2 now slowly begin to converge, as you'll eventually have no choice in who you play as. The final structure known as the God Box is within the amusement park, and as 9S enters, he says something which at first didn't strike me as odd. But the second time I played the game, I had a thought. Over and over. We are perpetually trapped in a never-ending spiral of life and death. I fear our enemies have picked up on Lady Zero's weakness. Your dislike of performing the same task over and over and over again. So, if this is the end of this branch, then... Wait, what? Oh gosh. I didn't lose a recording by accident, did I? Well, sure. That's all I'm supposed to be doing. But after all these bad endings you keep encountering, I'm really tempted to help. Over and over. Perpetually trapped. I have something which is little more than a theory, so please don't think this is truth. Rather the speculation of a big fan. I believe that the timeline of the Draconir universe is similar to that of a thorny crown. By that I mean it's a loop with branching paths splitting off from it. The path that the main games play out on, however, are all on this loop, and eventually, at some stage, the timeline will simply loop back around, having the same events occur over and over again. The reason why I included the tedium of killing things ad nauseum, something which is taken mainly from the Drakengard series, was to link it with Automata's themes of over and over. Again, it's like poetry, so sort if of they rhyme. Something that Accord says in Drakengard 3 makes me think this loop theory might have some validity, since she claims she's from the old world. By the way, I love her. I want to kiss that rosy little cheek. <laughs> 
And very recently, Yoko Taro confirmed on stage that a chord is currently located in the Kingdom of Night, a section of the world in Automata that is in a constant state of darkness due to the globe no longer rotating. This is due to the axis of the Earth changing since the year 2004 to the Automata period, which could potentially mean that the Old World is in fact located within the year 11,945. Could a future event perhaps send a city from the Old World back in time to the Drakengard period, only to loop back during the Queen Beast incident? Or could the Old World be named as such because it came from a point behind the Drakengard timeline? As previously stated, this is a theory, and it could very well be debunked with a simple, um, excuse me. But I feel it sparks discussion at least. The timeline of this universe is something that will endlessly fascinate me. As 9S makes his way to the God Box, A2 is also heading there due to the mysterious voice from the tower guiding her. 9S also makes the discovery that Pascal's village is in total ruins. If you decide to keep him alive but wipe his memories like I did, you'll see that he's forgotten his name, and he's selling the body parts of the children he loved so much. Why are you like this? This is why I believe wiping his memory is honestly a much crueler act than keeping him alive and letting him suffer. He could potentially let his sadness become strength, but instead this is where he's left. No memory of who he was, selling scraps of children, and more than likely ready to start this entire process all over again. Now, 9S enters the God Box and heads to the top, where he meets a familiar face. A familiar face whose story only becomes more tragic if you play her side quests. Operator 210, who was sent down to Earth with B model technology, renaming herself 21B, has now gone insane with the logic virus. During this fight, you can faintly hear her talking about how she just wanted a family. Within the side quest she gives you, she asks you to gather data on humans and a thing they had called families. This is why before, when she was talking to 9S as if she was patronizing him, she was actually trying her best to treat him like a son or a younger brother. All she wanted was a family to call her own. But A2 drops in at the worst possible moment, killing 210 and giving 9S even more motivation to see her dead. 2B told you to be a good boy. Yeah, well, I don't see 2B, so I'm gonna be quite the rascally little cunt. <laughs> Alright, fam. It's like we're all a big, happy family. Ah! 9S awakens with the god box destroyed, Pod 153 informing him that 210's black box signal is gone. You now have to make the solemn walk back to the tower, where we now have enough keys to enter. We then reach a segment which is less of a wink to fans of the original game and more of a punch to the arm. I'm sure this moment was meant to make fans be all Ah, they're up to it again, I see. Those cheeky robot cunts. However, this is anything but the case. Devila and Popola are here to help 9S enter the tower by fending back the machines, thinking that doing so will atone for the sins of the past. Both of the girls sacrifice themselves so 9S can enter his final destination, meaning the android now has to leave even more friends behind. The actual story of this model of Devila and Popola is yet another moment in Automata that'll stick with me. Before this, I thought they were honestly nothing else but a nod to the original fans of the game, but thankfully, this entire segment redeemed them in my eyes. This short story explains to us the plight of the Devila and Popola models after the Popola model went mad after Devila passed away. Due to dooming all of humanity, the other androids in the world wiped out a large quantity of them. This pair sticking together and surviving in harsh conditions, using each other as anchors and emotional support. What's sad is, I believe any Devil and Popola model would go insane if one of the other were to pass. They were created to always be together, so to have one stop functioning would be like having your entire reason to live stripped out from you. The ending of the story confirms why Devila and Popola now have this feverish need to atone for past sins. As punishment for their model's past mistake, they were reformatted and installed with a constant feeling of guilt. In some ways, the twins' final sacrifice is my hope that by doing this, the inhuman method of making them feel guilt will be washed away from them. But knowing how this universe works, I have my doubts. If anything, the fact they both passed away together makes me happy one didn't die before the other. A true bittersweet happiness.
Okay, right, let's uh, lighten up the mood a little. Before you leave, I have an update regarding this series, and it's mainly about part 4. I initially planned to combine part 3 and 4 together, however, as you can see, part 3 became a beast of a project on its own. In order to stop myself from burning out horribly, I've decided to make a smaller video in between part 3 and 4, which is based on a show that I've been meaning to cover for a few months or so. Part 4 will absolutely be the finale though, and will include things like the Yorha Boys stage play, side materials, and of course, ending Y. So hopefully you will all look forward to that when it comes out. Big thanks to Valkyrie Aurora for her cameo, you can find all of her content and more down below in the description, if you want some more Drake and Nier content to scratch the itch. And the artist responsible for her avatars is the wonderfully talented Milk Girl on Twitter. Her info can also be found down below, so go and commission her because she definitely deserves it. As far as what you can do to help the channel, the best possible thing you can do for me at the moment is to share this Automata series. If you think I put in a lot of work into these videos, then sharing them around and subscribing would make me a very happy boy indeed. Of course, there's also my Patreon, which has been a goddamn rock during these last few months. Absurdly happy I have people willing to help me out with my videos. And if you want to help and see your name scrolling by on the right, then by all means, go check out the link found down below. Thanks for sticking with me during this massive project, and I'll see you all next time.